Hi everyone, this is Adam Hops from the National Operations Center of Excellence. Thank you for joining us today on May's Talking Tim webinar series. Um, really appreciate everybody logging on. We'll go ahead and get started here in, in a few minutes. Um, just a few things uh, from the NOCO side uh, but before I turn it over to Jim Ostrich um, for the quarterly meeting. Um, you can see uh, on your screen there's a discussion pod there on the right. Everybody's signing in from, from where they're at and reporting on the weather, which is great. Um, and uh, if you have any questions throughout the, the webinar today, please be sure to use that chat box there on the right, and we can address those uh, at the end. Uh, Jim will be answering some questions and, and, and facilitating some discussion if, if people have ideas that they want to put in there. You also see some links down there at the bottom of the page, uh, including some, some Tim-related case studies that come from NOCO. Uh, and then you'll see uh, the NOCO Knowledge Center and, uh, and the NOCO uh, YouTube page there on the left. Uh, all the Talking Tim webinar series are on the, the NOCO YouTube page, the recordings for all of them, with the full presentations for March and April, and, and will be going forward. So please be, please be sure to check out that page. Follow us on YouTube where all of these will go. This, today's webinar will be available uh, within a week and, and there to share with all your colleagues and, and anybody who will be interested. So, so please do join that. Um, we're always honored to, to have FHWA um, to plan and, and host these webinars um, and honored to be a part of uh, Jim and Paul's uh, TIM program. So thank you to the two of them for, for doing this today. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jim. Thanks, Adam, um, and welcome to everyone. Uh, before I get started, I want to uh, extend our thanks to Adam Hops uh, at, at the National Operations Center of Excellence. He's been a great partner uh, in conjunction with the executive director uh, of NOCO, uh, Patrick Sun. Uh, indeed, we, we really appreciate you hosting this webinar. Uh, I want to say on behalf of Federal Highway, Paul Jordan and myself uh, as well, we, we're honored to be a part of this. It's not our TIM program. It's, it's the national TIM program with the national TIM community that you're all a part of and have gotten, to, gotten us uh, to this point with improving traffic incident management practices, saving lives for responders and motorists. Uh, reducing congestion and so many other great accomplishments. I want, also want to thank Katie Belmore uh, with HNTB and Rebecca uh, 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 Wessinger with Battelle, who supports the TIM training contract, and all the speakers today uh, that will be joining us, Captain Bear Wilson in Houston. and. Anyway, with that, we'll get started here with the update to the training. That, as you can see, May 22nd, this is hot off the press. We are making huge, let's see, before I actually get into the statistics, this slide here is one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, why we do what we're doing with this training nationally. Uh, these are the latest statistics. They may be off by one or two, but it's an alarming trend for sure uh, since uh, January of this year. So there it is. See it for yourself. Uh, and as Secretary Elaine Chow, US DOT uh, Secretary Elaine Chow said recently, um, the America's first responders, police, fire, EMT, towers, highway workers, utility workers, and others uh, whose jobs sometimes require them that they park on their vehicle on the roadway, roadway or side of the road, face this peril of being struck by uh, and in the line of duty and have paid the ultimate sacrifice in many uh, very devastating injuries. So. Uh, I want to start out our, our webinar today and, and others in the future highlighting this horrendous trend that's going on right now uh, just to set the stage, if you will. So keep that in mind always uh, and remember it. Um, next is the statistics. This is the national, the cover page of the, the bi-monthly report that comes out. Incredible accomplishment thus far 
since that since launch in summer of uh, 2012. We're now approaching the half million mark, and uh, to the point I was making earlier about the line of duty deaths and 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 just in general making our roads more reliable for the mobility of our, 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 our families, all of us, we need to continue this charge with the training. So Paul and I and, and all of us should ask, you know, for us to continue that, that push. And so uh, whether it's one four-hour training, if you're a graduated trainer, which many of you are, whether it's one training session a month or two or five, a quarter, whatever the case may be, we thank you uh, and, and ask that you keep it up. The in-person training still remains the best way to receive this training, uh, as Paul and I always remind everyone, but the web-based training certainly is something that's available and continues to be through the training arm of Federal Highway, the National Highway Institute, as well as our friends over at respondersafety.com, Steve Austin and, and Jack Sullivan. Uh, uh, who offer the training, the TIM training certificate uh, through their through their website as well. So, as we proceed here, here are the maps. I don't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. There's, there's been 408 train to trainer sessions nationwide. Uh, as I say frequently, the states are very much leading these charges. More states than even before our last uh, call. Uh, are conducting training to trainer sessions uh, on their own account, and that is a, a best practice for sure to refresh the bench and, and keep the training numbers going. This slide is the, the number of trainers nationally. Next slide here depicts the uh, both the in-person above the parentheses uh, number, which are those that are uh, trained in online and the online training uh, as I said earlier is growing and uh, certainly something to consider for those that may never reach the training in person please consider it uh, I know some states have have said no to the web based but I think it's something that uh, you should always consider uh, as an option and and as a refresher as well here, this is the total training by state. You can see uh, even even Idaho and Alabama and some of the states that were la lagging behind are already starting to grow. And now, you know, for sure, all 50 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico are are fully engaged. This is the national goal map. Um, and Katie, help me out here. If you're you're well, I know you're listening. What we the the big shout out here is for the number of states that are that are over forty five percent. Is that sixteen now? Yep, that's based correct. on the key, yep. I guess so, right? If I read the key, duh. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's a that's a big deal. Uh, that number in parentheses, just as a reminder of those that don't know, that is the the total number of responders that each state has. Uh, projected or estimated uh, that need to receive the training in their state, and that's all disciplines combined. It's not exact, and we recently gave states an opportunity to, uh, an opportunity to adjust that number up or down, whether it's volunteer fighter, firefighters or sheriffs or maybe even towers that weren't included before. Uh, but as you can see, the number in the lower left parentheses, uh, that 1.158 is uh, is our goal, and and as I hear from um, many uh, executives and, and mid-level managers, it's truly probably closer to two million that we need to, you know, make sure to receive this training over the next decade. Here's the uh, bar chart showing the numbers. And with that, I want to give a quick update. Well, here's the uh, the slide. I, sh I showed this slide before, but our meeting back in December with the executive leadership group, as they're called, the ELG, um, that 
come to headquarters and meet with us. These are executive CEOs from all the major associations, um, police, fire, towing, et cetera, AASHTO, transportation, and, and a few others, the EMS community for sure, and um, National Sheriff's Association, et cetera. And with, well, okay. Important, uh, important news for you here. Uh, we're obviously in the new year, fast approaching National Traffic and Incident Response Awareness Week, November 10th through the 16th, 2019. And um, this is our, our slogan, our new slogan that you see here on the banner, Traffic Emergency Actions Matter, be a part of the team. And you're going to you're invited, you're cordially invited to the planning sessions that begin on Tuesday to June 4th through Tuesday, um, the Tuesday of November 5th, uh, leading up to that, that week. Our contractor, Gannett Fleming, Chuck Yorks uh, and company leading it, uh, and many of you last year uh, participated, 36, I think, or 37 states. So I wanted to give you a heads up that this is coming. This is very important this year. Our goal is to have all 50 states, including D.C., Puerto Rico, uh, join us and have um, participate in some level of activity as, you know, whether it's social media, ride-alongs, you know, demonstrations, whatever it is, proclamations, that's another one, um, but just a, a big push. And we need to incorporate the message for the move over law, uh, you know, compliance in all 50 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico, as well as messaging regarding this, this carnage, this phenomena of uh, struck by that we talked about earlier. So stay tuned for that and be, be watching for the invitation uh, emails that will be coming out inviting you to participate. And, Please include your public affairs folks, PIOs, et cetera, in these calls. Um, next is, well, I want to, Katie, I, I, I don't want to, if, if it's okay, I'd like to move, I'd like to move to um, pass this presentation first. Paul, I hope you don't mind as well. I would like to go. Uh, uh, directly to the update by uh, Dr. Jonathan Kramer, uh, who is, and Dave Bryson, but Dr. Kramer uh, is going to speak here for a few minutes about the um, Commission on Accreditation for Pre-Hospital Continuing Education, uh, known as CAPSI uh, certification the federal, that we received for the four-hour TIM training back in February. A lot of you heard me mentioned this over the past year or so that this was coming to fruition and uh, thanks to Dr. Kramer who is the Office of Director of the uh, EMS, Office of EMS for NHTSA, uh, a hugely important partner uh, to Federal Highway and his team, Dave Bryson and many others, uh, Dr. Kramer represents uh, for us on this uh, certification our medical doctor and without him could not have, you know, this would not have been possible. So we're trying to reach the EMS and EM, EMT community, those of you who are paramedics and, and uh, emergency medical technicians, uh, that you can take this course now and receive uh, credit CEs for uh, certification as well as research certification. So with that, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kramer. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, and, and we also appreciate the um, ability to cooperate with you all on this. You know, as, as you noted earlier in the discussion, EMS is one of the disciplines that is, is significantly affected by these issues, and we um, have been trying for a number of years to increase EMS participation, both in the online and, and particularly in the in-person courses. Um, it, there's an ulterior motive for doing this, but one of the um, um, 
advantages or one of, one of the enticements, let's put it that way, of getting EMS personnel to participate is that they are all required over uh, the period of their recertification time to obtain a certain number of continuing education credits. And the ability to offer uh, credits for participation in the TIMS courses will be, we think, a significant draw to the EMS community. Um, I know that with the uh, agency that I'm involved on the Eastern Shore in Maryland, uh, we were able to get a number of folks into recent courses in Maryland and actually the, the ability to get, to get continuing education credits for them uh, was uh, definitely a plus in encouraging their participation. Uh, not surprisingly, they came out of the course saying, holy cow, this is a, a really valuable thing and we should have done it earlier. So we hope that will, uh, that perspective will continue to um, uh, increase as we move forward. The, the mechanism that is available at the national level to allow for those continuing education credits is uh, through the Commission on the Accreditation of Pre-Hospital Continuing Education, or CAPSI. As Jim noted, um, it's the, the nationally recognized entity that allows for uh, certification of continuing education programs both for state relicensure and for those states that require uh, certification by the National Registry of EMTs really the way to do it. Um, I will commend uh, both Jim and Dave Bryson on our staff for working through the application process. Um, just by way of explanation, uh, part of the approval of continuing education programs for EMS personnel uh, involves uh, evaluation and input uh, on those courses by uh, an emergency physician. So that's why we had the wonderful opportunity of, of working jointly with uh, Federal Highways to be able to do that. So I serve as the uh, physician of record. Um, my responsibilities just include working with the, the program team to, making, to make sure that the medical content of the program is inappropriate. So my area of focus is not only on the, the safety of the personnel responding on the road, but also to make sure that any of the um, uh, medical content issues are appropriate. Now that we have received that accreditation from CAPSI, there are just a number of logistics steps that folks have to go through when they're conducting courses uh, to be able to make sure that the, the credits apply appropriately. I'll ask Dave Bryson, who's um, among other things the education EMS specialist in our office, just to go through those um, logistics issues with you. We will be putting together some additional information about this process to uh, share with you all, but we're also going to be uh, much more widely distributing this um, course availability through some of the national um, EMS distribution lists that we have available that reach out to state EMS offices and local EMS agencies. So I suspect, I hope that you will be um, noticing much more interest and request for participation in the program uh, by EMS agencies all over the country. Steve? Very good. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. So the next steps, as Dr. Kramer said and Jim also alluded to at the uh, beginning in the introduction, will be for us at NHTSA and Jim and folks at Federal Highways uh, to get together and to populate. Um, looks like most likely what we'll do is we'll populate the, uh, the online course and give it a code and number so that as people take that course and that gets submitted by Jim to CAPSI upon uh, course completion, that will then give them the credit hours we talked about, which thanks to a new tool that CAPSI and the National Registry have developed, it just about automatically in real time gets those 
continuing education credits to the National Registry and the state those personnel are licensed in. Uh, so it's all but automatic for the personnel uh, once they take the course, which really is uh, the tremendous benefit. So we will populate the courses, and as we learn about the in-person courses, it'll be our responsibility, probably Jim and I working together, uh, to uh, give a course number based on the coding uh, that they give us. So as you know of a live course or you or your colleagues are putting them on, just make sure you coordinate through Jim. We'll give you all those numbers and information for the course to make sure there's seamless integration of those continuing education hours for your EMS personnel. Uh, uh, let's see, the certificate is still up, uh, so all that continuing education credit uh, is good through February of 2022, uh, so that is a very good thing. And then, of course, at the end of, for those that don't know, there is a process if we decide to can you continue doing this, which I believe we should, uh, but if we have the means to do so, there is a process to go through to extend that another few years if need be. So it looked like based on Jim's chart of the population of folks that have done the in-person and online, and I keyed in on the 12.5% of EMS personnel that have done it thus far, uh, we'll have to see how, how well we do here in the next couple of years uh, to get that number up much higher, uh, and then we can make a decision as a group uh, if we need to move on uh, further than that. I see somebody's going back probably to the, to the slide there. Yep. So with that, I think another uh, thing to mention to you all, just as a sidebar, it is uh, National EMS Week. So uh, Dr. Kramer and I will get with Jim and others uh, very soon to see if we can get uh, out to our constituents. As Dr. Kramer said, we have a fast way to get out to the National EMS community uh, EMS updates. I think it'll be critical for us to, to do the steps we talked about, create the courses so they can be found on the CAPSI site and get that information out as soon as possible to folks. Uh, and we also, for those that don't know, uh, the National EMS Memorial uh, just had its service this past weekend here in the D.C. area over the National Harbor. Uh, and it was noted there that the majority of folks, as uh, Jim had pointed out with that statistic in the beginning of how many incidents there's been just in 2019, a uh, number of people recognized there in crash events and also uh, tied to struck by. So pretty emotional week for us here on the EMS side. Uh, it'll be great to get out good news like this and to continue spreading the word. So Jim, that's all I have. Um, any questions of they, us? Yes, sir. Yeah, there, there's actually a number of questions that are coming in on the chat pod, and I'm going to ask Katie uh, to organize us, um, try to at least. There's quite a few, you know, few questions, I believe. But first, I want to, my gosh, I want to thank you uh, and Dr. Kramer. Again, this is huge for, for us for all of us, uh, and in particular the, the EMS community, as Dr. Kramer uh, alluded to, and I know folks like Via Kramer with the National Association of State EMS Officials and Mike Touchstone with National EMS Management Association and, and many others uh, are, are very happy that this is occurring. And again, we couldn't have done it without you. I want to mention also that uh, Dr. Kramer and, and Dave uh, are also part of our executive leadership group, and um, boy, we, we've got a lot of work to do. Also, the certificates uh, that you saw was the one for in-person training, uh, but the, you, you heard me mention that uh, respondersafety.com or the Res uh, Emergency Response Responder Safety Institute the certificate that's there uh, that they generate, uh, we're off, my office will, will be working with them as well as the certificate from the National Highway Institute for their web-based training uh, to also, um, they'll be tweaked a little bit to, uh, as far as the fields for the paramedic or EM, EMT 
uh, you know, identification numbers, course numbers that, that Dave was alluding to. So there's a little bit more work that I need to coordinate with uh, with um, David, you know, Office of EMS at NHTSA, Dr. Kramer's office on that. So just wanted to mention that. Uh, so once again, thank you, gentlemen, for everything you do. And let's see, questions. Katie, did you copy uh, as far as any questions? Do you want to try to field some now for them, or do we want to wait to the end? I think I think as long as Adam's okay with it, it'd probably be best if we try to answer the questions right now. Um, the first one is in regard to if the uh, continuing education is awarded for both train the trainer as well as the four-hour class. Um, so I believe we focused on the four-hour class, uh, Jim, but please correct me if I'm wrong there. Well, I'll answer that for you, I think, because um, yeah. Typically, train the trainer courses, because they're a supplement to the actual education program, are not eligible for uh, any, there are some supplemental education credits that you can get. But for this type of a thing, it would be only for the basic course. Perfect. And then um, a question about an announcement notice that we can forward with all the relevant info. And I think that's something, uh, that we still need to pull together and then we can distribute out to the TIM training group, um, you know, instructions where you can find the certificate and how to go about making sure um, your EMS attendees get the credit that they need. So I don't think we have that right now, but I think that's definitely no. something yeah. we're going to work on and distribute in the near future. Yes, that's correct. And Dave alluded to it somewhat. We're, you know, yeah. we're, we're, I'm going to work with David. We're going to work with David to, uh, you know, address all that. That's a great, great question and, and point that stay tuned, soon, soon to happen. Yeah, and that, that will contain the course number and the other information that you yep. need in it. Yep. Exactly. Thank you, Dr. Prim. And then the one about the any other? I'm sorry, mm -hmm. the one about the CAPSI certificate, as mm -hmm. Jim mentioned, we'll be modifying the uh, overall course certificates to include, pardon me, to include the um, uh, FC appropriate information. Yep. And that will be part of what we send out to everybody. Yes. Permanent. Okay, perfect. That should be all the questions, Jim. Okay. Well, thank you for those questions. Next, we're going to move. Uh, Paul's going to uh, handle this one, correct? Or is uh, Rebecca? I can. I can. No, no. This is a no, Rebecca. This well, be her. Yeah. okay. Uh, let me introduce the one and only, real quick, Mr. Paul Joden, our National Tim Program Manager and partner in crime, uh, along with oh, oh, uh, I oh. see Rebecca Brewster. Is that Rebecca joining you on this one? No. Um, yes, we want to go I back. Just to saw Rebecca, I just saw Rebecca's yeah. photo below yours. That, that, was, that was just a, a, a hint of things to come, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. good. <laughs> Welcome. Go ahead, Paul. Um, yeah, so, you know, just before I get, I get started on the, on the uh, post-course assessment uh, training tool results, um, you know, looking at that chat part, man, I'll tell you, Jim and I are easily excited anyways, but, boy, I, you know, it just gets me so excited and, and, and to see all these people from every state in the union just about all looking at um, you know this is the first time I, I've seen us do this is, is just to chime in from north south east west coast to coast south north you know mid part of the country everyone working in the same direction and, and seeing so many friends new friends old friends um, soon to be friends I mean this just is exciting to see uh, to see all these people from all over the country all working in the same direction on the same on the same stuff it's just um, um, sorry I just got emotional there for a second so now I digress <laughs> but now I'll I'll move on um, so we it's you know, quite all right <laughs> we appreciate that Paul thank you yeah, you're it's, absolutely it's, right it's very cool that chat pod right now so um, 
Jim and I have made a decision. Um, we, you know, we, many of you know, we've had this TIM training post course assessment tool. We had surveys at four different levels um, that we conducted. Um, we, we um, have got a lot of good information from it, from it that I'll share with you in a minute. But we have decided not to move forward with the tool. Um, it didn't seem to resonate with the responder community. We have the information we, we need. We've got a lot of good information. I'm going to show those results right now. And, um, um, but I did want to make you aware we won't be harassing you about completing your, your, um, your, um, your tools again and, um, and the results. So we have a report. I won't read the report to you, but uh, it, um, there's a final report that's posted online. It's on the Federal Highway website, or we can just give it to you if you, if you reach out to us with the results of, of the, uh, you know, the survey from the different training. Let me assure you, let me assure you that it is all extremely positive. So the responders who you know are tough, are tough uh, to please, they'll, they'll tell you like it is, as they should. Um, you know, we the training has received nothing but positive results. So this is something in your back pocket when someone wants to say, "Well, so what about the training?" Um, this is something you can see that the re that the that the responders, um, you know, really felt that this was, um, you know, that this was, uh, you know, something that was a, a very very worthwhile um, endeavor. So. Um, I don't know, if, Katie. We have it that they can download. Wait, wait, well, this is available. So I was online. gonna, I was gonna say, Adam is actually gonna make this available as one of the downloads for this okay. webinar as well. So, at, and when he has the downloads, this is it, this will be part of it. So okay. you can get it there, and then it'll also be available on SharePoint and other places. Yeah, it's on, it's, it's already it on the Federal Highway website. I. Um, I, I actually mm -hmm. got this from public affairs in a timely fashion, which was surprising to me. But uh, anyways, there's a, a lot of good stuff there. It's only like um, we, we purposely made it short and sweet just so that, um, you know, that it would be easy for you to use and to share with others. So um, um, please take it, review it, use it, ask any questions you might have. Katie was involved and Jim and I. Um, in, uh, in, in, in doing these evaluations. And actually, Rebecca was actually as well, uh, but that's not why she's on with us today. So, um, yeah, so um, this is the next steps. We, we, um, we just told you about that. And um, Jim, is this back to you? Or Katie or Jim? Or some training materials? Want me, to want me to handle this real quick, Jim? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I just, uh, as part of that, um, the L3 to C, or sorry, the course assessment tool, um, we are just going to make minor tweaks to the training materials. So like it said on the previous slide, we're removing the instructions for accessing the site um, from the student handout. We're also going to remove that slide um, from the PowerPoint presentation so that information isn't, you know, in there to direct people to something that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but this is a super minor update, so we're just going to call it version 3.1, and it'll be dated May 2019. Um, the only other thing we're going to do is we just had a minor revision to slide 136. Um, it was actually uh, an improvement to the slide we have that Virginia came up with, and I think there's a couple other states that are already using it in their state specific, so we just wanted to use this opportunity um, to, to make that minor update. Um, so we'll have all of those materials uploaded to SharePoint um, by early next week, um, and then we'll send an email out to the normal TIM training um, distribution point of contact distribution list to let everybody know it's up there um, and available. Um, and we are going to put a record of revisions at the end so people can easily see the changes. Um, they're pretty minor, uh, so certainly continuing to use the old version wouldn't be a big deal. But we just wanted to make sure we had those out there for people. So and that people knew what, you know, what was what was different between version three and three point one. And that's it. Okay, thanks, Katie. Go ahead, Paul. No, no, go ahead, Jim. Jim, go ahead. Nope.
Okay, what happened to Bears? Uh, Bears up next. Well, I thought. I think. I think. Was... Yeah, I think Paul oh. and Rebecca are up next, and then Bears. His presentation is a whole separate presentation. Oh, okay. My apologies. Rebecca. Okay. Yep. So we'll. Um, oh. I'll take it from here, if you don't mind, for a few minutes. And Jim and. Me too. Um, um, you know, again, um, you know, so Jim and I are trying to streamline things as best we can. We know how busy everybody is. We know how, how tough it is to uh, keep things in. So in, instead of, you know, we're doing this Talking Tim webinar the fourth Wednesday of every month. We also wanted to do a webinar on the, on the you know, the, shop, the quarterly webinar on the Shop 2 training. So we're going to continue that. That's why we're sort of commingling. Uh, today, and another thing we're co-mingling is uh, we usually have a whole webinar on just the, the, the Tim capability maturity self-assessment kickoff to kick off the season of the self-assessment that everyone loves. So, um, you know, we decided to instead of having a, a separate webinar on the self-assessment and then a se separate webinar for the for the you know the, the talking Tim or the quarterly the shop two quarterly, we just kind of putting it all into one in the, you know, respecting everybody, that everyone is busy. Um, so it's the fourth Wednesday of every month. We'll, we'll give you the, I'm, I'm real close to having an, 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 an exciting agenda for next, next month. Um, um, we're probably going to be talking a little bit about CAD. We're probably going to talk a little bit about something tactical, um, uh, boots on the ground type of information um, that you can use on scene, and then um, a, you know a pro program level. It's sort of the format, loose format that we'll be we'll be going uh, using every every month. So um, we'll be uh, Rebecca is going to uh, Rebecca Brewster um, is a support contractor from Atri is going to talk about the self assessment both last year and this year. Um, but I, I just want to mention for a, a, a brief minute that, you know, why it's important. It's important every year to get this framework for a, a, a holistic TIM program. So TIM program is just not, it's not just about data. It's not just about the TIM training. It's not just about committee meetings, but there's a whole a whole um, a framework that's identified in the self-assessment. So, you, you know, you should sit down with your partners and try to answer the questions and determine at what level you're at for each area. Um, you know, who should complete it, the top 75 metro areas, and then anybody else. Um, it, you know, every state really should be completing one at the state level if you don't have a top 75 metro area. In every committee, every single committee, there are well over 100 committees, somewhere between 100 and 150 committees by my guesstimate. Um, in my opinion, they all should be completing the self-assessment. It helps your stakeholders understand what a holistic and, and the framework. Um, it helps us gear here nationally how well we're doing, and last year we jumped um, 2 percent. So. Um, you know, we continue to improve every year. We've, we, we can, and Rebecca will talk a little bit more about that. But so I might urge you all that are involved with the self-assessment, and most of you are. Um, I urge you all to push your area, your committee, to pick one or two things from the self-assessment that you can go to another level. So how do we go from one level to the next? And um, what are those one or two things that we can do to continue improving? Uh, over the years. So um, for this year's self-assessment, again, trying to respect everybody's time and try to streamline things, we took a look at um, streamlining the self-assessment. We didn't make a big change, we, but we did remove all the supplemental questions this year in an effort to try to reduce the amount of time it takes to get through the self-assessment, and, um, and Rebecca will be, will be talking about this. Next year we're going to look at maybe even streamlining it even further. So. Um, with that, if there's any questions, always reach out. Most of you know how to get a hold of me. So with that, I um, pass it off to Rebecca to explain better than I just did, I'm sure. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. And um, I'm just going to echo your comments about how exciting it is uh, to see the discussion pod where everyone has weighed in, because uh, so many names are familiar to us at Atri as the Federal Highway Support Contractor for the TIM self-assessment for so many years. We've worked with a number of you over the years on the self-assessment and always appreciate your feedback on how we can make it uh, better and more useful as a tool for you in your respective TIM programs. And as Paul said, one of those, um, some of the feedback we've gotten is it is 
uh, oftentimes a lot to complete, and so we've been looking at ways to make it easier. And I think uh, for those of you who have a lot of uh, experience with the self-assessment, the 2019 version will look a lot better uh, because, as Paul said, we've taken out almost all of those non-scored supplemental questions, those ones where we ask for additional information and we generally had a comment section and, uh, in many cases, a non-scored supplemental or extra question attached to almost every question in the self-assessment. So you weren't only scoring your program's progress, but you were providing additional information. And uh, while a lot of folks did that, not everybody did, but it got to be a cumbersome way for you to have to complete it. And so we took a hard look at what those non-scored questions were asking. And we determined that with all but four, and I think there were, Paul, I think there were 39 non-scored supplementals possibly, so we got rid of 35 of them. Um, they have been pulled out, uh, so it'll save you a lot of time in responding. I'll show you the four that we've kept in. Uh, as I said, we used to also have a place where you could put comments for each of the uh, scored questions and the non-scored questions. We've taken those comments out, um, those comment sections out, but we still encourage folks, if, you, if there are additional comments you want to make about the program areas, for instance, if there's additional commentary you want to provide on how you do TIM performance measures or additional comments you'd like to provide on your TIM training, in each of those subsections in the self-assessment, uh, you will see an opportunity to provide that additional information or commentary. So you'll still have the opportunity to weigh in. It's just not going to ask you to do so on every single question. And I think uh, you'll, for those of you who have experience with it, you'll appreciate that more streamlined version. As I said, we've kept four of the non-scored questions in. And when we were looking at them, we wanted to keep in these four specifically because they um, supplement the annual analysis we do. They also feed into, of course, the the TIM training course because we ask about any other topics that you might be providing training on. Uh, we are tracking annually how frequently these uh, the TIM teams meet around the country. Is there is there growth in that area? Are they falling back? And so that question 1A is staying in there. We have for a number of years tracked what's going on with safety service patrols, and so you'll see that non-scored supplemental question in there. And then uh, Paul asked us to add that fourth non-scored question, 52A, last year, so it was a new one last year, to start to get a sense about how folks are um, integrating their CAD systems with their TMC software and systems. And so we're um, looking at that. We'll ask you to provide a score on that. It won't be part of the calculation of your overall score, as it wasn't last year, but it does give us a sense overall of, of where folks are in that CAD integration. So you know that you score your program for each of the questions, uh, one to four, one is the lowest, four is the highest. And for each of the 55 questions in the self-assessment, we give you guidance. So score your program one if this, two if this, three if this, and four if this. And we just encourage you to use the score that most closely aligns where your program is. May not be an exact fit, but but generally, you can figure out, because we provide enough detail, uh, which score is closest to yours. And so this is one example of that scoring guidance. This is the very first question on the assessment that asks about the existence of a formal TIM program. And you can see that um, you would score your program one if TIM activities are just occurring on an ad hoc basis and you don't really have a formal program up to a four where there's a, a formalized multidisciplinary TIM program. So again, you know, as you're working with your uh, stakeholders in your area to complete the assessment, identifying where across this continuum uh, you, your program is will help you figure out uh, which score to uh, give yourself on the assessment. I think it was two years ago we added a question uh, to gauge who is participating in the completion of the annual assessment. Uh, since its very beginning in 2002, it is uh, we've always encouraged, or 2003, I should say, we've always encouraged the self-assessment to be done as a group exercise with all the TIM stakeholders. And so it finally dawned on us that we should sort of gauge if that is, is still continuing to happen. And so we ask 
at the very beginning of the assessment for you to tell us who has been part of the assessment process. And so you see the types of stakeholder groups there. And here's a, a chart that just compares where we are percentage-wise of all the assessments that were completed in 2017, uh, represented by the blue bars, and in 2018, represented by the orange bars. And for all but one of the stakeholder groups, we saw increases in the percents of programs uh, that were using or including these stakeholder groups in completion of the assessment. So that's really good news. Um, you know, we'd love to see these numbers continue to grow as more stakeholders or newer stakeholders uh, not only engage more actively in your programs, but uh, specifically get involved in completion of the TIM self-assessment. Uh, as Paul said, uh, Federal Highway likes uh, certainly all the areas with a, in the top 75 metro areas to complete a self-assessment. If you're in a state that does not have a top 75 population-wise metro area, um, certainly uh, Federal Highway would encourage uh, a statewide uh, self-assessment to be completed. But really anywhere where there is a group of uh, TIM stakeholders who get together to work on traffic incident management, that is an opportunity to evaluate where your program is using the self-assessment. This is a map that uh, we have populated with locations with a well-supported traffic incident management program. This map is a work in progress, and we would love to see more red dots on this map. So certainly, uh, if your program is not represented by a dot here, uh, we would certainly encourage you to reach out to us so we, that we can add it uh, as well. We originally utilized folks who were completing the self-assessment and who scored that very first question in the self-assessment as a three or a four. We included them on the assessment, but more programs have reached out to us as well uh, who have met the definitions uh, of a well-supported traffic and management program and added to them to the map as well. So we would encourage you to do so as well if your program is not represented here. So a little bit about uh, the findings. And, and Paul, before I go on to the findings from 2018, anything on the 2019 assessment you want to touch on? And I'm going to take Paul, that you're on <laughs> I was on well, mute, um, even though okay. I don't um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think I think I've said all what I what I said. Just encouraging folks to to complete them and 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 don't be afraid to use them and 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 you know and, and to, to push that they can complete it on time this year. Everyone, I know everyone asked for an extension for a day or two, but uh, we really need to get the information in uh, for other reasons. Um, you know, as the deadline that Rebecca will describe. So, okay. Great, thanks. So uh, in the 2018 uh, self-assessment, we had 98 locations submit during that open cycle, which generally runs from now through uh, the end of August. Uh, and that was the same as what we had in 2017. But we saw scores increase uh, in the 18 assessment over the 17 assessment. We had an average score of just over 70 out of a possible 100. Uh, recall that we always mark progress in the self-assessment over what the baseline scores were. And the baseline scores were the initial assessments that were done in 2003, 2004, and uh, a few locations didn't get started till 2005, but those were our baseline assessment scores. Uh, and you can see that we've progressed uh, nearly 40% increase over the baseline, so great progress. Um, there are differing levels of uh, advancement depending on how large the area is. And so we always, for purposes of the annual report, break out uh, the overall scores for the top 40 metro areas population-wise, top 75, and then everyone else, or as we call it here, the non-top 75. And you see those scores here. Uh, this just shows the past 10 years of scores. Um, and for those who have been with us on the self-assessment for a number of years, you know every several years we go through a fairly significant revision. The last such revision to the self-assessment was done in 2015, and that uh, 
probably the biggest difference there was we brought that greater level of specificity and guidance to what we were asking people how to score their programs. And so we saw a little bit of a dip there, but we've been uh, generally climbing since. And so in 18, we returned to the highest score in the assessment that we had seen uh, since uh, pre, uh, uh, pre-revision. We always, in the annual analysis report that we uh, do for Federal Highway, we look at the highest scoring questions and we look at the lowest scoring questions. For the most part, these five questions and maybe one or two others are generally among the highest scoring. They're the ones who typically show up here as key areas that TIM programs across the uh, country regularly do and regularly score themselves high on. Um, so while the uh, ranking of these may change, generally it's these five and, and perhaps one or two others that are typically in our top five to seven highest scoring questions each and every year. Likewise, we have, since the beginning of the assessment, typically seen the lowest scoring questions in the TIM performance uh, measures subsection of the self-assessment, and in 2018 that was no different. Uh, the, the good news is, while they are the lowest scoring questions, typically the highest jump over baseline, so the biggest progression we've seen in scores, is also in the TIM performance measure subsection of the self-assessment. And so while these are lower, lower scoring, they are continuing to increase, uh, thanks in large part to all the work that Federal Highway has been doing in this area. And so you see in the 2018 self-assessment, the lowest scores were specifically about uh, secondary crash uh, as a performance, secondary crash data as a um, performance measure, as well as um, incident clearance time. We also ask a series of questions on roadway clearance time, but it was the secondary crash and the incident clearance time questions that were among the lowest scored. As I mentioned, um, while they are among the lowest scored, we do see improvement, and uh, that was the case in 2018 over 2017. And you can see in those questions, uh, four, uh, four out of the five, we saw an increase uh, in the percentage change from the 2017 average score. So again, good forward progress in the area of TIM performance measures because of all the work that is being done there is, is starting to pay off. I mentioned when discussing the supplemental questions that last year we added a new non-scored supplemental that was designed to gauge uh, CAD, uh, public safety CAD integration with um, TMC software. And so while this score is not part of the support section score or the overall score for your area, we did want to gauge where folks are, and so you can see that in last year's assessment, almost all of the respondents provided a score, 94 out of 98, and uh, the average score was 2.29. And so we will, um, again, look at that uh, this year and see if that uh, score continues to increase. Paul mentioned uh, one of the key reasons that Federal Highway has been doing the self-assessment is to gauge nationally where TIM programs are, but also to provide you a tool locally to figure out where your program may need some work, uh, things you want to advance on. And one of the great pieces of the self-assessment is that it provides pretty clear guidance on how you can some some pretty clear and discrete steps you can take to improve your score from one assessment to the next assessment. And so here you see some of the sample guidance that is provided, in this case, for uh, the use of emergency vehicle lighting. And again, as Paul indicated, it's a great idea to pick one or two or three questions or areas in your, in your TIM program, use the results from the self-assessment, self and use this uh, guidance uh, as a program of work for the next year, some things to work on uh, to improve that particular question score. I always like to give recognition to the folks who score highest in each of the 
uh, three areas of the self-assessment. You'll recall that the questions are divided into strategic, tactical, and support. And so among each of those areas, we have the highest scoring 10 programs here. They are not in rank order. They are in alphabetical order. But uh, congratulations to the folks in all these areas for, for really working hard to uh, move their and advance their programs along. So as Paul said, we're kicking off the 2019 self-assessment season. Um, one of the uh, uh, great pieces of feedback we got was when we send you a summary report of your scores, we've typically sent it as a PDF. And that's great, but it doesn't make it easy for you to use the information you entered in one year into the next year if, for instance, some of your comments are the same. And so we're going to be sending you your 2018 summary report if you were a participant last year. We're going to send it as a Word document so that if the information for a question is the same, you can just cut and paste from the 18 report into the 19 online version. So uh, again, designed to help you streamline that a little bit. Uh, we're going to, of course, send you a Word version of the question so you can work from that manually with your TIM committee or task force as you start to come to consensus on the score. Uh, you will always, once you submit your self-assessment online, you will get within one day a confirmation from Carla Rose on the ATRI team who will confirm that we have your self-assessment submitted. And then within three weeks of submitting it, we will send you your 2019 summary report and that will include those list of recommended actions. So again, it's, it'll tell you how you scored on each question, how you scored yourself, and what your overall scores are. But it will also give you recommended steps that you can take to move your program to the next level for the following year. Here's our timeline. Uh, Carla is going to start sending out the user guide and questions. And again, remember, this is going to be more streamlined. We've gotten rid of the non-scored supplementals, and we're going to have uh, just one opportunity for comments at the end of each of the uh, subsections. So those will start going out to you via email from Carla Rose on May 23rd. Uh, we will open up the online portal on June 3rd, Monday, June 3rd. And then uh, that week, Carla will also start sending out to you individually your 2018 summary reports. You all received them last year, but we'll send them to you again as a Word document so that if you want to cut and paste any of your comments or other information that you submitted last year into the online portal for this year, you can do so. And then uh, because we're getting a little, little earlier start than we do typically, uh, but we've left the deadline the same, the end of August, so the last days to submit uh, your 2019 self-assessment will be Friday, August 30th. So that's it. Um, we can take questions. Paul, I'll put our contact information up here as well. Um, Carla and I are the uh, subcontractor support team to Federal Highway, so feel free to reach out to us. And obviously, Paul is available for questions. So while anybody's typing, uh, this is Jim again, uh, and I apologize, Rebecca. Uh, just for the record, if you could um, share your title, and again, uh, most people know Atri, but if you could share all your title and oh. organization's name. Certainly, certainly. Um, uh, I'm the president of the American Transportation Research Institute, Atri. We're actually the trucking industry's not-for-profit research organization, um, but we have been active with Federal Highway in the area of traffic incident management for 25 years now, over 25 years, um, because of the importance of traffic incident management and what you all do every day to keep trucks moving down the road and, and keep freight moving. So wearing my trucking industry hat, thank you very much for all you do uh, to keep trucks moving down the road. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. You, you've been a great partner and uh, can't do it without you as well. So. Anyway, Paul, any any remarks here at this point? I I think um, I think uh, I've said enough for today on on the self assessment. <laughs> <laughs> so um, everyone okay, gets it, everyone gets it, and I you know they know I'll, I'll be harassing those that are traditionally late. So um, uh, um, but um, 
looking forward to the season and looking forward to you all getting together with your stakeholders and, and uh, stirring the pot a little bit again this year. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I'll say real quick that uh, how important it is. I know it's the self-assessment in particular has been, been on, uh, going on since 2013, uh, but a, an important tool. 2003. I'm sorry, 2003. <laughs> My apologies. 2003, uh, I was with DC DOT at the time and remember doing the first one with uh, DDOT. But more importantly, I want to just underscore how important it is really for states, for, for us at Federal Highway and for you, your individual states, to know where you stand and it goes to the maturity of, of your programs and you might not think, you know, possibly that that's super important, but it truly it is. It, it's important for your leaders to know. And another quick comment I want to say in terms of the, the tool that we, evaluation to, tool that we've, uh, Paul presented on earlier, uh, that we're still very much in the mode of understanding and hearing from from the individual states, uh, agencies, and what have you, whatever discipline it is, the the success stories uh, in terms of you know performance, uh, just anything and everything that you can provide that proves that. Uh, for example, training your responder community is, is reducing, you know, clearance times, roadway clearance times, secondary crashes, fatalities, and all the rest of it. That is, we're, we're at a point where we need to continue to sh show those results. So um, with that, we can move on. I guess now it's, uh, Adam, it's Bear Wilson who, who will present. Well, Jim, I don't know if you saw Bear's uh, note in the chat pod. Bear, are you on? What? What did? I'm sorry, I Be, missed it. Bear's Bear's note in the chat pod says, and this is the good news and bad news. So we have a fire captain that that had agreed to join us today, and he's got a great presentation. Those of you that were at the National Fire Academy um, meeting, but he he said that I am the I'm at the fire station today, and we were just dispatched on a call, and I'm the only supervisor on duty and have to run. So, um, oh my gosh, God <laughs> so, love them. Yeah, so the, yeah. You know, it, it, that's what happens when you uh, have responders. Um, you know that you know, and he's he's great. He's a great yeah. Player, he's a great champion. Um, Huge. But, you know, uh, we don't want him to miss a call. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and no, Paul, you're absolutely right. And God bless him, and hope hope he's safe in 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 all the the response. Uh, to whatever the incident is in Houston there. But I, I want to share, as Paul said, Bear Wilson, Captain Bear Wilson for Houston Fire has been hugely successful and instrumental in uh, expanding the training in the Houston, uh, uh, city of Houston and Houston uh, region. And recently he, he and with the, you know, help of others, but he uh, was the catalyst for the entire department, Houston Fire, uh, receiving the TIM training. And I also want to say that, that he doubles. Uh, Bear, you know, is also a constable. So he, he's both, you know, law enforcement and fire rescue EMS. And the guy is just incredible. As Paul said at our recent uh, National Fire Academy symposium, Bear presented and well, it's okay. We, you know, we can always have Bear on next time. And, we'll, have to, uh, we'll have to get him on next time. Maybe he won't when he's not on duty. Maybe he will record. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know about that because Bear is so dedicated. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. He's always on well, duty, it seems. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, with that, unless people have any other questions, thoughts, I'd like, Adam, if you don't mind, uh, there's a lot of, uh, well, the entire Tim community that's still with us here, over 100, almost 130 folks. Uh, questions still, you know, there's opportunity to still ask questions here, but maybe if someone, uh, we open the lines and, and someone would like to make any comments, that kind of thing. Could I start off uh, with a comment, Jim? Absolutely. So I, I just, 
you know, when I where I got so excited a little earlier, and I'm, I'm, I apologize, seeing all all everyone from all over the country, uh, far and wide, uh, joining us. Um, there was this one old friend that I've identified on there that's been in this game with Jim and I since the early 1990s. I'd like to give a shout out who's been fighting the the good fight since the 1990s that I know of. Um, Mr. Brian Purvis is uh, is uh, has been with us for a long time working uh, working in this in this area. So I just uh, just wanted to uh, say hello to him and for all the great the great work that he's always done uh, throughout the country. Um, Brian. Yes. You have been muted. Your microphone has been turned on. Apologies, Jim and Paul. I was an attempt to unmute everybody. I accidentally muted the two of you mid-sentence, uh, just as you're paying tribute, Paul. <laughs> okay. All right. So you got that. Shout out to Brian Purvis, who's been with us for a long time. Jim and I's buddies for a long time. So. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. Um, okay. Any anybody else? This is your opportunity. Uh, uh, don't be bashful, my gosh. Jack Sullivan, you still there? Yes, yeah, so if folks want to talk, they should uh, unmute themselves using the webinar system. Just uh, if you're able to hit that up on the top uh, by your phone, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Jack, are you still with us? Jack's typing, okay. Okay. Well, Jack's the uh, training director now full-time for uh, RespondersAfety.com Emergency Responder Safety Institute that I mentioned earlier, uh, the response, uh, Responder Safety Learning Network that falls under the, the Institute, uh, uh, which many of you uh, are familiar with. And if, if not, you should go and, and check it out, RespondersAfety.com where the TIN training certificate resides, along with many, many other, I think over 30 online modules now uh, that are free of charge, just like all our training is, whether NHI or otherwise. But uh, Jack and his team over there, Steve Austin, they've, they've done a, they're doing a phenomenal service to the National TIN community uh, providing this, these trainings. So, Anyway, thank you, uh, Jackie. Smith Lot Mountain Lake, okay. Yeah, he has to remind us all, well, we're all working. He's on vacation. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. What Good a vacation. for him. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Good. Hey, one, one other thing, Jim, that if you don't mind, um, I just wanted to uh, remind everybody, I just mentioned again, that Jim and I are, are working on um, pub, um, a public safety summit, mostly for senior managers, well, for senior managers that um, we're looking at it maybe uh, second week of November. And they look, the tentative date is Thursday and Friday, th 14th and 15th. Uh, we're going to have, looks like we're going to have some open seats. Uh, we can't um, supply the, the travel funding, but if any of you are able to, uh, able to are interested in joining us and you're able to secure your own travel funds, I think we would have a seat and love to have you attend. So just keep that in mind. If you have any more questions about that, just reach out to me uh, directly. Um. Yep, that's, that's a good one, Paul. Some practitioners mixed in with the, uh, with the executives. Um, we're trying to, uh, with Jim and I are trying to put this thing together. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it's a it's a big lift. Paul's leading. I'm I'm helping as well. Uh, but it's going to occur at headquarters, like Paul said, November 14th and 15th, Lord willing. And the cool thing is, we're going to combine the uh, uh, National Traffic Incident Response Awareness Week event uh, at headquarters on the on the second day, on Friday the 15th. Uh, and and I know Friday's tough, but we're gonna we're gonna ask the executives, everyone, to bear with us and please understand that we need you to stay. No early departures will be allowed. Just kidding, but <laughs> anyway, thought I'd plant that seed. Uh, but um, 
one thing I want to mention, too, that I know Angela Barnett, who's on the call today from Arizona, leader in towing recovery nationally, but in the Arizona and Phoenix area, uh, I know she mentioned, she wanted me to mention, and I forgot to mention in, in this as well, important, on May 10th, uh, Congressman Andy Biggs uh, reintroduced a resolution supporting state move-over laws. And this is a big deal, folks. We, I, I'm pretty sure, maybe didn't capture everyone, I sent this out a couple, couple weeks ago uh, to the National TIM community. Uh, because like with the training itself, we need to, to really ramp up the messaging and, and marketing and uh, social media or otherwise to the motoring public uh, of the importance of move over laws. So Congressman Biggs uh, is a huge supporter in highway safety and, and so that's, that's a really good thing and he proposed the National Move Over Law Day uh, to occur the third Saturday in October. So FYI that if you didn't know it and um, um, spread the word, if you will. Jim, um, I think someone, Katie or Adam, put up the national, um, the ITS uh, responder day. You want to talk about that for a second? Oh, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. That's another one. Here in Washington, D.C., the Intelligent Transportation Systems or Society of America this year is hosting their annual conference in Washington, D.C., uh, June, I think it's 4th through the 7th, um, uh, at the Washington Convention Center. And as, has, and as has been the tradition, I believe now 10 years, I believe, right, Adam? Um, this is number nine. Include... Next, year, 10, next year, be our Okay. Day. Thank you. Uh, a, a emergency response or responder day as part of the conference, and this year is no different. And thanks to Adam and the whole planning committee, uh, we've put together a, an incredible event uh, on the 5th, Wednesday the 5th, and vehicle displays outside um, as well as exhibits inside with a lot, you know, major focus on safety service patrols, the technologies, the latest and greatest vehicles uh, from various states, including New Jersey and D.C., Virginia, Maryland, et cetera. And uh, we're also going to be having a live session inside uh, to discuss a major tanker fire uh, late in the afternoon on the 5th. And, uh, testimonials by struck by uh, folks, survivors, if you will, and um, what else did I miss, uh, Adam? Did I miss anything? I think I think you got it all. It's going the day is going to kick off with uh, a rally of everybody who's there, uh, updating the the broader community on uh, the quick uh, one minute updates on uh, of what they're doing and the challenges that they're facing, and uh, and how we want to engage the ITS community to help address those challenges. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So stay tuned to that. If you're able in the area, you're able to attend. Some of you may have already, already registered for ITS America. And, uh, there's a lot of great sessions in general and uh, Jim, important the to... The responders get a, um, a free yes. pass on the, on the registration that day? They do. That is, that is correct. Thanks to Adam and the whole committee. Um, for sure, yeah. Good point. Important point. Thanks, Paul. And um, another, let's see, there's another point I wanted to make. Did I go on it? Senior moment. <laughs> anyway, um, Chuck Yorks, are you on the line? Although he may be on the other call, there's actually a planning call going on, I think, as we speak. He was on earlier. He was on earlier. Yeah, yeah, I, I noticed. Um, well, we can give him back any, some time. Yeah, yeah, I was going to – you took the thought right out of my mind, Paul. So, okay, well, as Paul said, let's let's give you back uh, 15 minutes or so of your, your day. And on behalf of Paul and I and Federal Highway and – uh, the National Operations Center of Excellence and 
and our whole team here. We want to thank you for joining us and, and hope you join us again next time. And we, we give you thanks and, and uh, thank God, you know, that we all be safe and kept safe and continue charging, you know, ahead with, you know, our efforts in traffic incident management. And so be safe out there. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jim. Adam. Thanks, Paul. Bye now. Adam. Everyone.